I would like to thank in their absence our pastor and first lady for this opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk and declare the word of God. I'd like to thank Reverend Reeves for that lovely and warm introduction. Although I told her that although I may do anything that I'm asked to do, I have learned how to say no. So if you turn in your Bibles to Galatians, the sixth chapter, beginning at the first verse, it reads, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted Carry each other's burden, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions, then he can take pride in himself, without comparing himself to somebody else, for each one should carry his own load. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity. Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, God, as you have been there when I called on you, allow me to be here as you call on me. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, as we exist in a troublesome and tumultuous time, we find ourselves asking questions of ourselves and of God. When we analyze society and the events taking place around us, we often find ourselves puzzled and perplexed trying to articulate what it is that we are living through. We're existing in a reality that one at one time or another would have seemed to be inconceivable. We are existing in a time where it is getting harder and harder to tell the truth from a lie. We're seeing the global collapse of sound governance policy aside. We're seeing a disregard for personhood based on race, sex, creed, orientation, geographic origin, economic status, level of education, and almost any other demographic that you could quote. There's a growing divide between the haves and the have-nots. The poor and the marginalized are noticeably on one side and the rich and powerful are on the other. Institutions, liberties, freedoms, and opportunities are under attack and as crazy as all of this seems, the real offense, the truly upsetting and unsettling thing is that within the church, when it is viewed from purely an institutional sense, the place where God's people ought to be able to gather to express their faith and fears and be comforted and restored from the oppression of the world, we have the same divisions, dereliction, and debasement as the world around us. My brothers and my sisters, for the next few moments, I'd like to preach from the topic, It's Rough Out Here. It's a sad day when there is an air of familiarity between the words of government apologists and church institution apologists. It's a crime and an embarrassment when the talking points of the ones who are descendants of the tradition of the persecuted Christ mirror the talking points of the agents of empire that persecuted Christ. We must be watchful of those who claim to be proclaiming the word of God when in actuality they are seeking to indoctrinate you into a system that actually oppresses. This is done when the true word of God is not followed. 
There are several reasons why the word of God is not followed. It's because people have become turned off and turned away from sound doctrine and they have begun to listen to whatever it is that makes them feel good. It's because people have become fed up with raising their voices only to be shouted down and because we live in a culture that runs contrary to allowing the message of Christ to take hold of us. The truth is that there is a lot of bad theology creating bad Christians. And when people hear sound theology and sound doctrine, they are uncomfortable with how it does not fit their way of lives and they turn away from it. The Christian church is called to live out the mission and message of Christ. The message of Christ is love, justice, and liberation. It is by working to always improve upon these principles in the methodology that has been given to us by God through the scriptures and direct revelation that we are able to please God. It will not always be easy. And we will not always be on the same page, but we must strive as a community to work toward not only instituting these principles, but also living them out. In this epistle, this letter to those in the Galatian region, Paul is teaching a way of life, that there may be an element of cohesion amongst those that have heard the word of God. Paul is instructing those that have heard the message of salvation to, and have come to believe. Paul is talking to the formerly unchurched people in the infancy of their faith walk. And he's also talking to those that are theologically challenged. He's talking to some people that go to church but just don't get all that church stuff. This letter, which has become known as the book of Galatians, is a source of contention in and of itself and is a letter dealing with contention. Because there are two conflicting views as to when the book was written and where the people to whom Paul wrote existed. The first view is the North Galatian theory, which holds that Paul was writing to the churches located in North Central Asia Minor and wrote between AD 53 and 57, following his second missionary journey, even though this has not been proven by the writings of Acts. The second and later view is the South Galatian theory, which holds that Paul wrote to the churches in the southern area of the Roman province of Galatia, and some believe that he wrote the epistle between AD 48 and 59, and some believe that it was written between 51 and 53. After his first missionary journey, which predates the Jerusalem council meeting, which was written about in Acts, the 15th chapter. I highlight these things that we ordinarily wouldn't like to talk about, think about, or even study because it provides context to the plight and plot that is central to this text and our lives. It is evident in the Bible and throughout history that the church is no stranger to conflict. From the beginning of time to the present, there is a litany of conflict that has stirred up, and yet we find that God has always been there. We see in the Gospels that Jesus was constantly surrounded by conflict and he never backed down from conflict that met him. And to deny the fact is to deny the power and authority in the midst of conflict. I'm talking about the power and the authority of God, that thing which when people come at us and say, why do you church people do this, that, and the third? Because it doesn't say that in the Bible, we start to walk away from them and don't engage. I'm talking about that kind of conflict. I'm talking about the kind of conflict that you meet in your life when you want to tell somebody off and you want to be holy at the same time and you're not sure exactly what to do. I'm talking about that kind of conflict. I'm talking about the conflict that we see evident in the Bible and in our lives. The Judaizers were Jewish Christians that had heard the revelation of Christ. They had come to believe in how God had intervened in the world and sent his son that we might have life and have it more abundantly, but they remained captive to some of the practices and customs of their old life before that 
revelation. They were those church folk that can't stop doing things the way they've always done it because they don't understand the realm of moving beyond what they've always done, whether it worked or not. It was their unwillingness to leave their traditions that led them to doubt the authority of Paul and to call for the Gentiles to submit themselves to practices of circumcision to prove that they were saved. They were, in a sense, arguing for the preservation of the purity of their standards so that they might make it great again. Paul remind, responds by reminding them of when and how God used him, which gave him the authority to preach and to teach and then gave a lesson on justification. Paul demonstrates that dealing with things that are legal or merely traditional that have no bearing on one's soul, salvation would lead to a confused people more concerned with pacifying God than actually serving God, more concerned with pacifying men than being of service to men. Paul then expounds upon his theological understanding in the third chapter of Galatians that we are justified by faith and not by law. Tell somebody all you got to do is believe. The conflict in the text is that one group has one way at looking at justification and salvation based on their experiences and is using that view to persuade another group. They're trying to persuade that group to act in a way that is consistent and practical only when viewed through their lens and nothing else. The Judaizers felt as though if the Gentiles did not come to believe in the way that they had believed that they were not truly saved. Justification is defined as being God's act of removing the consequence of sin while at the same time making a sinner righteous through Christ's atoning sacrifice. Paul maintains that because Jesus hung on the cross, all that believe in him are justified by faith. They're believing and do not have to adhere to the laws that were followed by the Jews prior to the death of Christ because the law had been fulfilled. Here in the text, we find a showdown between ethics and doctrine. The Judaizers have overrun the Galatian province with their conservative Christian inward focus, make Galatia great again rhetoric, and have attempted to legislate what is and can be done to another person's body. They've called for caution in analyzing who and how people that do not share their history and culture can come to associate with a culture that doesn't belong to them in the first place. They have attempted to build a society that is reminiscent of cages, police brutality, oppression, wage discrimination, and widespread poverty, and do it under the guise of Christianity, and Paul is forced to call them out on Twitter and say, do you know God? By forcing others to adhere to your traditions in a way that's inconsistent with the works of God, even when you believe you're not wrong, is an act of oppression in and of itself. That's why we must be careful when we go out and spread the gospel that we're taking the word of God and not our misinterpretation of what God has revealed to us. Salvation when offered by way of a corrupted doctrine can never and will never be free for all to have. And if the salvation that's being offered cannot be had by all, it is not salvation in any sense. It is th it's protectionism that maintains the pr supremacy of one group over another, but yet we're called to love all people. When we hear and spread the message of Christ crucified and resurrected, we share a message of love that transcends the problems of this world. But yet that message of love does not ignore the problems of this world. This is the ethical side that Paul was trying to get to. Our message of salvation must recognize the hell that people are experiencing on a daily basis and grant them the dignity of their personhood. 
that we might see them as the sum total of their being, the parts we understand and the parts that we don't, the parts that we appreciate and the parts that we could do without. We have to recognize the hurt that we can heal and the hurt that we have caused. We have to understand this love for the community, both the church and the unchurch, as it's laid out in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Does your faith display that type of love? There are things that we in the church hold near and dear that have nothing to do with the works of the Spirit, which is love. We've created a false sense of being and tried to spread it as a substitution for the true gospel. Paul, in writing to the Galatians, seeking to help them engage in an intersectional theology in that he is speaking to the unification of different groups that are trying to exist in one place under the name of God in a way that does not marginalize, ostracize, or subjugate one group over another. When we look at the division that exists all around us, we must struggle to see God in the midst of it. There's an odd event taking place where two things that should not be able to exist in the same place are existing together, and we don't know what to make of it in tandem with showing love our understanding of salvation must be oriented always and at all times towards justice this justice is not the justice in a sense of retribution or getting somebody back this is talking about returning to the will of God It's not simply social justice, what we have concerned ourselves with solely in the black church, but when we speak of the manifestation of God's ordained justice in a way that's intersectional and thereby inclusive, we must think of justice in terms of racial justice, gender justice, LGBTQIA plus justice, economic justice, environmental justice, and so on, and so forth. The justice that God has called us to institute permeates every corner of the globe, reconciling all of God's children and all of God's creation back to God. Paul begins this section of the epistle by speaking of the importance of bearing the burdens of others and the responsibility of those within the community to correct those that have gone astray. This is justice. The academic definition of justice is aligned with fair treatment of others. When we think of the goodness of God and all that he has done for us, even when we didn't deserve it, even when we were living a life of sin, we're thinking of justice. The just acts of God are the very attributes that we come into the household of faith exclaiming it's justice when we say that he's a healer it's justice when we say that he's a deliverer it's justice when we say that he's a way maker and a burden bearer that is God's justice and because God saw fit to be that for each and every one of us it's our duty and responsibility to go out and represent that in the world the other part of spreading the true meaning And the true message of salvation is that it must be presented as liberating. Salvation does not mean anything if it leaves you in the very place that you were always in. When we come to accept the salvation that was instituted on our behalf by God being hung high and stretched wide and nailed to the cross, we have to recognize that that was an act of liberation. 
we have to understand that because of that act, we belong to a power much greater than ourselves. Because of that act, we belong to a power that's much greater than any system that man can, has, or ever will create. That's liberation that we see, know, and understand that we are not constrained to the parameters of this world, and that's why building walls won't work. God is calling us to go and speak for the ones that do not know how to argue against police brutality, systemic racism, xenophobia, poverty, and government-sanctioned bigotry oppression by declaring that although you may be hurting and although you may be disenfranchised, although you may be sick without access to adequate medical care, although you may be working two and three and four jobs or you can't find a job at all, although you may have been left behind by everybody that you've tried to get out of a bad situation, although you may be struggling due to the effects of slavery, of Jim Crow, of redlining, the war on drugs, the prison industrial complex, inadequate funding for your schools, food deserts, crumbling infrastructure, toxic water, poor, uh, poor air quality, and a fool in the White House, you've got to stand up dust yourself off, stick out your chest and keep moving because God has heard your cries. God sees you, God cares for you, and God has a purpose for your life. Church, we have to understand what God is revealing to us for times like this. We have to find our voice and speak up on what God through Christ spoke out against. We have to reject the evils of the world and advocate for love, justice, and liberation. We have to understand that God is calling his church to go out into the world at a time like this because there is madness breaking loose all around us. But before we can go out and proclaim it, we have to get ourselves together. Our evangelism, the spreading of God's word, cannot be motivated by self-aggrandizement. Our evangelism cannot be so that we can have somebody look up to us because we know more about a subject than they do. We cannot go out and try to find people with good jobs so that they can help us pay our bills or fund our functions. Our evangelism must be motivated by Christ. We have to go and offer redemption to those that feel that no one sees them. We have to go and offer love to those that have been told that they will never amount to anything. We have to go and offer peace to those that never seem to catch a break. And we have to do it because we understand that Christ loved us. He loved us enough that he came and hung on a cross that we might find this salvation for ourselves. And we'll be blessed because of our efforts. It's when we go and share the good news of Christ that we begin to see the world not in terms of fear and depravity, but we, that we're consistently told about. We'll begin to find joy that has always been there while we were too consumed by our pain. And when we begin to see that joy, we will often find a reason to praise. This is a part of the mystery of God, that evil and goodness can appear to be in the same place, that oppression and liberation can appear to exist in the same place, that poverty and extreme wealth can appear to exist in the same place. And when we cannot wrap our heads around it, we throw up our hands, we get tired, we walk away and we say, you all go figure it out. I don't have time for you. There's foolishness. Enough of that. I'm turning off my TV, going to bed, pulling my pillow over my head because I just can't. It's rough out here. But we have to go and advocate on behalf of those that don't have the words to advocate for themselves. For too long, we've tricked ourselves into thinking that joy and praise are synonymous, meaning the same thing. But what it really is, is that our praise comes from our pain, and that's where we find joy. My praise is directly related to my anguish, my anger, and my difficulty. And I know this sounds like it might not fit theologically, because it's not 
in line with the feel-good messages that we always hear about praise and joy. But, but if you just stick with me for a second, I think I might help you to see it. The truth of the matter is that because I've come to recognize that I could not be going through the hell that I'm going through and remain relatively sane if it were not for a God that loved me despite my failures, if it were not for a God who saw me at my worst but still recognized the good in me, I, I, I would have given in. And when I begin to understand all of this together, I'm pushed to a position of praise. When you begin to praise, you begin to find joy because you're drawn closer to God who is a source of joy. When you begin to praise, you begin to find that you're not constrained by the troubles of this world because you find yourself in the presence of God who is a problem solver. When you begin to praise, you find yourself not being broken down by the policies and systems of oppression because you're pulled closer to a God that has all the authority. When you begin to praise, you find yourself ready, willing, and able to pray to God who is a healer. When you begin to praise, you find yourself in the position to call out the evils of empire that seek to hold back the blessings of God from people who have been set free. When you begin to praise, you recognize that it may be rough out here, but God is still in control. So my brothers and my sisters, like Paul said to the Galatians, let us not grow weary of well-doing for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Let us do good to everybody. Let us go and live out the message of salvation that we might take salvation beyond the four walls of the church into the world because when you know that you have had an encounter with God, when you know that God has picked you up and turned you around, when you know what God is doing in the lives of the people around you, you've got a reason not just to praise but to help